Hello, my name is Roger Watson and I am the Academic Dean on a part-time basis at Southwest Medical University in Luzhou in China. Clearly, given the current situation with travel, it's quite a few years since I visited there or indeed have, have visited China. I'm very glad to be giving this talk today and very, very grateful for the invitation uh, to talk to colleagues and friends at West China School of Nursing and I'm going to talk today about research into mealtimes and older people with dementia and I'm going to do this with a specific reference to my own work in this area. First of all I want to consider some background to the problem that I'm going to talk about today. It's reckoned that every 3.2 seconds one person in the world is diagnosed with dementia. In other words, in the time it's taken me to present this slide, five or six people have already been diagnosed with dementia. It's estimated that at least until 2050, the number of people with dementia will grow. We're currently slightly beyond 55 million people with dementia. By 2030, it's reckoned in the world there will be 78 million people. And by 2050, when it's expected to tail off somewhat, it can't, of course, continue forever. Uh, the uh, number of people with dementia is reckoned uh, to be around 139 million people. Now, dementia is not a specific disease. It's a syndrome caused by a range of diseases. I'm not going to go into those now. You will already be familiar with them. Uh, the principal cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease, but there are other conditions like cerebrovascular dementia and Lewy body dementia, which are also quite common and a lot of smaller uh, in terms of prevalence forms of, of dementia. But it's a syndrome and of course being a syndrome across all these disease types it does have some features in common. So what does dementia affect? Well dementia affects intelligence, uh, judgment and behaviour. It also affects memory and it also affects language. So it affects these by affecting different parts of the brain, uh, principally the frontal, the parietal and the temporal lobes of the brain. It doesn't really affect movement too much. And the problems associated with these are threefold intelligence, memory and language. The problem with Decline in intelligence is that you lose your ability to solve problems. With the decline in memory, you become forgetful and it's quite common for people with dementia to become lost. And in terms of language, people with dementia often have difficulty with communicating, both understanding and expressing themselves. However, beyond these cognitive disabilities, there are manifestations and problems associated with dementia, which of course is where we as nurses interact with people with dementia. We interact with them because of the problems of wandering. People with dementia often, as we said already, become disoriented and lost. There are problems of aggression, which can make people with dementia quite hard to manage, especially at home. They may become unfamiliar with their spouse or with their close family and become aggressive towards them. This may lead to injury. It may also lead to them being institutionalized in a hospital, both for their own protection and for the protection of those around them. But of course, that aggression can also be a problem for those of us working with people with dementia. 
Then there is the problem of incontinence, and it's usually functional incontinence in the sense that the signals of, of uh, having a full bladder or a full bowel are gone, but also combined with um, memory loss and confusion. And finally, the problem or the issue that I want to talk about today are problems of feeding and nutrition. I prefer to talk about these collectively as mealtime difficulties. The older people with dementia do eventually uh, lose the ability to know when they have to eat and often have difficulty with the actual mechanical aspects of eating and it can be a very distressing thing for relatives to deal with and also for clinical staff to deal with. I've been working in the area of uh, mealtimes and dementia now for more than 30 years, certainly since I was in clinical practice uh, and I left clinical practice in 1989 and then came into academia and it's been the one constant thread of my work throughout all of my academic career. Incidentally, just for your interest, I have now retired from academic work, but I have recently been supervising PhD students who have been doing projects on mealtimes and dementia. And what I'm going to do, as well as reporting some of my early work, is to report some of that work uh, here. There are clearly nutritional aspects of uh, mealtime difficulty in people with dementia. And it's very common for people with dementia to lose weight, especially in the later stages. They sometimes go through a period of overeating uh, in, the, in the middle stages of dementia. That tends to be quite short, but then a longer phase of having difficulty with eating and losing weight. However, it's also worth saying that weight loss and dementia has uh, some other causes, there's some organic cause of weight loss as well, and it has been observed to precede uh, um, difficulty with eating. So there are, it's a complicated um, relationship between uh, feeding difficulty and, and weight loss and nutrition and dementia. However, we have an immediate ethical and legal issue here. The ethical, specific ethical and legal issues will differ in different countries, of course, because ethical and legal laws are not necessarily international. But for us as professionals, we have a problem. Uh, and the problem is we cannot interpret the actions of a person uh, with dementia. We don't know why they are not eating. We don't know if they're eating because they don't want to, because they feel full, because they forget to eat. Uh, we don't know if this is some way of um, a cry for help or if they genuinely uh, do not understand that they need to eat. We don't know. And if we do know, then if we did know, even if we did know, then we have difficulty knowing what we should do. We don't know how to alleviate eating difficulty. The research in this area is very, very poor, so we don't necessarily know what to do. We don't know what constitutes force feeding. We tend to think of force feeding as holding someone down and forcing them to eat. But of course, if you're off continually offering food, even gently on a spoon or on a plate to someone who doesn't want to eat, uh, that could be considered to be force feeding, certainly in some jurisdictions. And the other problem, which I'm not going to talk about too much today, but we, we, we don't actually know when to stop feeding a person with dementia. We have to face one big pro issue, which is that the person with dementia will eventually stop eating. And we then have to make the decision about whether we are prolonging their misery or are we actually helping them by um, forcing them to eat in the later stages or nourishing them by some other means. So these are big ethical and legal dimensions beyond the scope of my session today, but I just wanted to uh, to raise them and I wanted to raise them because I want to briefly, very briefly consider uh, one aspect of the feeding of people with dementia. And that is uh, tube feeding. 
Now, in my jurisdiction in the United Kingdom, tube feeding is almost never used with people with dementia, but I have seen it being used in other countries. And I think it's worth noting as professionals uh, a review by Finucane et al. It's a very old review carried out in 1999, but it was uh, definitive and it was a systematic review of tube feeding in patients with dementia. And it's worth me just recounting all of these points here. Tube feeding benefits were the f as follows. There was no reduction in aspiration pneumonia in people with dementia, no effect on any clinical markers of nutrition, no improvement in patient survival, no improvement in uh, decubitus ulcers or pressure ulcers as we call them, no reduction in infection, no improvement in functional status, and no improvement in patient comfort. In other words, from the clinical point of view and from the research perspective, tube feeding is never recommended for older people with dementia. Uh, the feeling is not only is it not doing these things here, it may actually simply be uh, prolonging or adding to their discomfort and misery. So I want to say that we should not be using tube feeding at all. But because of this, it's uh, necessary and, 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 and ethically necessary as an evidence-based profession to look at other ways of alleviating feeding difficulty. And this is where I want to turn to my own work. Now, in 1994, uh, slightly before that, but uh, we published the first paper in 1994, myself and a colleague called Ian Deary at the University of Edinburgh, we published a scale called the Edinburgh Feeding Evaluation and Dementia Scale. We called it the Ed-Fed Scale. There are different versions of this. Originally, it had 11 items, then it was reduced to 10 items. Uh, but six of those items are specifically about measuring the feeding-related uh, be behaviours of patients. Uh, so there are different versions of the scale that's used in different ways. But the basic scale, as far as I'm concerned, has got these basic six questions. Now, I'm not going to go into the EdFed scale in any detail here at all, but it asks questions like, does the patient ever refuse to eat? Do they turn their head away? Do they spit their food out? That, that kind of thing. And it asks the clinicians to rate them uh, either never, sometimes or often. Uh, it's a fairly easy scale to use. And I was very pleased uh, that it was referred to in the following report. In 2014, the Alzheimer's Disease International Association published a major report on nutrition and dementia, covering all aspects of nutrition and dementia. And they had a section on assessment, and that's what the EdFed scale is used for. And they said the following about the EdFed scale. They said it's the most widely used and best validated measure. Uh, it's the, and they refer to you to the 10 item EdFed scale developed for those with moderate to late stage dementia and brief and simple enough to be used in routine care. So they were actually recommending the use of the EdFed in routine care. And it said also that the EdFed has been subjected to extensive psychometric testing demonstrating internal consistency, hierarchical scaling properties, uh, confirmatory factor analysis, con construct convergent discriminant validity, and also inter-rater re reliability and test-retest reliability. So it's been thoroughly tested and uh, used widely. I'm also pleased to say that it's, it's been translated into a great many languages in Europe and in Japan, and it's also, I'm happy to say, been translated into Chinese. And this is the uh, Chinese version of the EdFed scale, the CH EdFed scale. That was published in the Journal of Clinical Nursing. And if anyone is interested in finding out more about that, then you're welcome to contact me and I can send you, uh, I can send you more information. I may even have a copy of the scale in Chinese. 
It's free to use. There's no copyright on it at all. However, I'm not here specifically to advertise the EdFed scale. I want to talk more about some aspects of my own work and how the EdFed scale has been used in further research. Now, in 2005, I published a systematic literature review along with my colleague, uh, Professor Susan Green, on feeding and dementia, a systematic literature review. And there have been several reviews since then which are much more rigorous and up to date. But this particular review uh, gave rise to a, several strands of work. And what I want to do here is just summarize what the results of this systematic review told us. We retrieved a total of 67 papers and only 13 of these addressed interventions aimed at helping older people with dementia uh, to feed. All of the studies reported positive outcomes and there was only one randomised controlled trial. And of course, randomised controlled trials are the gold standard. And the fact that they all reported positive outcomes suggests that there may have been some reporting bias here. The most common intervention was music. There were no standardised interventions or outcomes across the study, so it was very impossible to compare and to combine these studies in any kind of meta-analysis. None of the studies reported the use of power analysis to decide on their sample sizes, so the results may not even have been valid uh, at that level. And also there were problems in some of the studies with confounding variables. There could have been any number of explanations for the outcomes. In summary, what I'm saying is that in 2005, the uh, state of the science in mealtime research for older people with dementia was very, very poor and there was plenty of scope for research. Now, in 2010, along with colleagues in Taiwan, I published this study, which was using space retrieval and Montessori based activities in improving eating ability for residents with dementia. This is an interesting study for several reasons. First of all, it was the first truly randomized uh, controlled trial and, uh, of, people, of, of older people with dementia with respect to feeding. So it's the first rigorous study. It's by no means perfect. It's, it's a difficult area in which to do research, but it's been uh, often referred to since then. And it was, it was groundbreaking in that sense. And also the ED-FED scale was used as one of the outcomes in, in this uh, particular study. So what I want to do here is just to report briefly on those findings. So the results showed that after the intervention with either Montessori or space retrieval, um, the Edinburgh feeding evaluation and dementia scores and assisted feeding scores for both groups uh, were significantly lower. In other words, these interventions were actually lowering the feeding difficulty that was being observed in these patients. So the interventions were actually helping them uh, with mealtime activities. And very much to our surprise, the nutritional markers using the mini nutritional assessment in the space retrieval group at any rate was significantly higher than that of the control group. So this was interesting to us that not only were we alleviating the difficulty observed, we were also helping to improve the nutritional status of these patients. Now I forgot to explain what Montessori methods and space retrieval methods are. Uh, Montessori method is a, a method of educating um, children and it's a way of breaking things down into smaller tasks and space retrieval is similar, it has some similarities to Montessori, but this is a way of prompting people and giving them time to learn from those prompts and trying to reduce the time needed uh, to help them to understand what they're doing and then hopefully with those prompts to allow them to eat by themselves. So I'm, I'm sorry to say there isn't time 
here to go into these particular methods in any detail. They will come up again later with one of my PhD students, but essentially they are educational and retraining methods that have been used uh, in other situations. Um, for example, for people with learning difficulties. So we consider that they could be applied and have been indeed applied successfully to older people with dementia. Now what I want to do is to turn to two other strands of work. One is a strand led by one of my doctoral students, Alvisa Palesi, who is from Italy. And the second strand was led by Salma Riemann uh, from Pakistan. I'll report the work involving Alvisa first of all. Alvisa Palesi carried out uh, for her PhD study a series of studies and these were large uh, retrospective studies using data gathered in the north of Italy on older people with dementia. They keep extremely good records from nursing homes there of the patients, of their uh, diagnosis, their activities of daily living, and their feeding ability and nutritional status. So first of all, uh, Alvisa carried out a five-year retrospective regional study. Uh, this had uh, uh, records from over 13,000 patients. So these are huge uh, gold standard studies, if you like. And she looked back to try to predict from this work what the incidence of the predictors were of self-feeding dependence amongst older people in nursing homes. And what she found is that uh, at the individual level, uh, increased functional dependence raised the proportional odds ratio of over four times of increased dependence in self-feeding. So any problems with uh, functional dependence uh, increased self-feeding. That makes sense. The more dependent the patient is, the more they rely uh, on being fed. But clearly there are lessons there for clinical staff to, to know this, to know that the more dependent the patient is generally, the more dependent they may be specifically regarding self-feeding. And again, not surprisingly, the degree of cognitive impairment, in other words, the degree of dementia, the lack of social interaction, uh, occurrence of other markers like pressure sores and comorbidities, as well as clinical instability and time, uh, the time since diagnosis, all raised the risk of, of self-feeding dependence progression. So anything that's associated with dementia is also associated with the risk of self-feeding. Again, the lesson here is that to know that the ability to feed oneself is something that will decline in older people with dementia and it's associated with other comorbidities. And then at the nursing home level, this was at the level of managing the home, an increased number of beds emerged as a factor which also increased the proportional odds of dependence and self-feeding. In other words, the bigger the nursing home, uh, the more beds there were. And this suggests, of course, that uh, the more beds may, does, does not necessarily suggest more staff. So presumably, the busier the staff are, and the more likely patients are to have difficulty with self-feeding. So these results are not that surprising, but they are in a sense definitive because they were studied rigorously on a large sample. So the next study that was carried out uh, by the same team was to look at what encouraged uh, self-feeding. So using uh, a similar data set, uh, Alvisa studied interventions maintaining eating independence in nursing home residents and did this across several centres. And this study involved 13 nursing homes and again a very large sample of, of patients. We used um, interviewed uh, 54 healthcare providers and we used uh, 13 focus groups here. Uh, this was to get uh, the impressions from the staff who were experienced at working with these patients, uh, what helped them to eat.
So the results here were broken down as follows. The things that promoted and maintained eating performance for as long as possible included uh, environment, in other words, by ritualizing the mealtime experience and controlling the and controlling the environment. In other words, deliberately setting up an environment that would encourage eating. Uh, in other words, uh, having a, a, a meal time that was uh, regular, that was quiet, uh, that the residents knew when the meal was coming. Uh, social by actually structure, structuring effective mealtime social interactions. In other words, by uh, making mealtimes a bit of a, a social event rather than a clinical intervention. And finally, by individualizing eating care for each res uh, resident. In other words, finding out what each individual resident needed. Now, this is a qualitative study. These are the impressions of these staff. Uh, this is not quantitative data, but it does give us some insight into the kinds of things that could be done by clinical staff in order to help their uh, patients or their residents uh, to eat. Next, a quantitative study was carried out. And this study was a path analysis of the direct and indirect effects of a unit environment on eating dependence amongst cognitively impaired uh, nursing home residents. Now, this study was carried out on over 1,000 uh, residents. So again, it's large. Uh, it's definitive and it's very rigorous. And the results of this study uh, are as follows. The results of this study are presented as factors preventing eating dependence. In other words, factors uh, promoting independence in eating. And these are presented under three headings at the individual level, at the nursing care level and at the nursing home level. At the individual level, uh, eating dependence was re related to functional dependence measured by the Bartel index. In other words, the better the functional independence, the more likely the patient was to be independent in feeding. That, that makes sense and it ties in with the previous results. Uh, eating in a dining room and not eating alone uh, tended to promote self-feeding and also having a close relationship with family relatives. Now, there's a message here for us as clinicians to encourage the presence of family members during mealtimes. At the nursing care level, uh, the greater the number of interventions aimed at promoting independence, promoted independence in eating. So if nurses are actually actively doing things to promote independence, this does help the patient. So the message there is that we should be doing things to help them to eat. And at the nursing home level, uh, aspects of the environment, such as space, um, safety, lighting and outdoor access, the better these things were uh, all uh, together and independently, the more likely it was to encourage uh, self-feeding amongst residents. And of course, the message there is to have nice nursing home environments that sometimes beyond our control. But some of these aspects, such as safety and having access to the outdoors, uh, are well within our control. So a, a number of things there uh, at the individual, at the nursing care level and at the nursing home level, all of which are capable of promoting uh, independence in self-feeding. Now, the next study looks specifically at what nursing home environments can maximise eating independence amongst residents with cognitive impairment, uh, looking at findings from a secondary analysis. Again, this is carried out on a sample of over a thousand patients. Results here are quite straightforward and presented under uh, two points. First of all, alongside individual and nursing factors, in poor nursing unit environments, residents with severe cognitive impairment showed increased eating dependence. So those which had low environmental scores uh, were more likely to be dependent in eating. Again, that ties in with the previous study. And in contrast, better environments uh, 
similar matched residents showed maximal eating performance. Uh, I'm not going to go into these results in any great detail, uh, but we've already seen how better nursing home environments, and there are specific measures of uh, environment within nursing homes, improve eating amongst patients with, uh, with dementia. So those are all the studies from the uh, from my colleague uh, Alvisa. Um, they have given us, uh, I think, considerable insight into the things that we can do individually uh, and indeed uh, collectively at the nursing home level to improve uh, eating uh, independence amongst older people with dementia. What I want to move on to now is uh, another study which is quite different, and this is the study carried out by my PhD student, um, Salma Riemann. And this study is summarized in, in a single uh, paper that's been published from the study so far. We also published another updated uh, systematic review. Uh, the systematic review, of course, included more, more studies uh, than our original review in 2005. There's been a great deal of work done here. But what this particular study here was aimed at was evaluating a brief intervention for mealtime difficulty uh, on older adults with dementia. And what we did here was we, we carried out a, a study using single case study methodology and we used what's called an ABA design, which I'll, I'll show you in, in the results. So we used spaced retrieval here uniquely and Salma used spaced retrieval to try and train the uh, older people with dementia to, to eat better. And we did a study of uh, f something like 15 participants. Uh, not all of them responded very well to the, uh, to the intervention. Some died before the intervention could be completely carried out. And we did find some relationship between the severity of, 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 of someone's dementia and their ability to, to respond uh, to this intervention. However, we did have considerable success with, um, with some of the patients, and I want to just to show you uh, those results here. First of all, to summarize the results, um, we found that a mean time of over 100 hours was needed to deliver this intervention, and the number of sessions uh, required for each patient required from about 90 to 222. That doesn't mean uh, 222 interventions. This means uh, sessions to actually get them uh, responding to the spaced retrieval. Uh, there's a particular process that's gone through for that. And again, uh, if anybody's interested in this more specifically, I can uh, send, send the, the papers to them. Uh, the length of time that each participant retained information for all the sessions uh, ranged from about 13 to, to 28 minutes. Uh, so with spaced retrieval, you're trying to increase the length of time for which they, uh, for which they retain the information. So if you can prompt someone uh, to feed properly using spaced retrieval and they can keep the information for 28 minutes for about half an hour, that's probably enough. Uh, to help them to to get through that that particular that meal time, and the 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 study was carried out in a in an A B A. In other words, uh, A means intervening, B means withdrawing the intervention, and A means um, reinstating the intervention. And for those study for those patients who were able to go through the whole A B A process. We did manage to reduce the difficulty with meal times uh, between the two phases of the study for most of the participants. There were some reasons why some were unable to uh, to, 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 to continue with the intervention. And then uh, we concluded that spaced retrieval is a useful uh, method for reducing meal time difficulties in older uh, participants in the study who had dementia. So what I want to do now, and this will explain the, the study in a little bit more, more detail, is to show you uh, a set of results from uh, individual patients. I'll show you the first one and explain it in some detail, and then the other uh, sets of results look almost, almost exactly the same. So this is what an ABA study looks like on an individual patient. You can see there are three phases demarcated as A1, B, and A2. 
uh, phases A1 and A2 are identical in the sense that there's no intervention during that phase. We just study the, the person's feeding difficulty. This was done using the EDFED score. And on, in the B phase, uh, the spaced retrieval was implemented. And you can see clearly in this patient and in all the patients I'm going to show here, and these were all the patients who completed all three phases of the study, that the feeding difficulty declines uh, during the intervention phase. Now, in this patient, it went back up again in the, in the final phase. And the bottom two graphs are measures of the uh, mini nutritional assessment and the um, and, and, and the uh, body mass index. And what you can see is that during the intervention phases, the body mass index and the mini nutritional assessment scores increased. So not only are we having some effect here on the patient's behaviour, we are quite remarkably having some effect on their nutritional status. So that was the first patient. They were presented separately in separate figures. Uh, in the second patient, you can see a similar pattern uh, during phase A, the A1, where there's no intervention, compared with phase B, where there is an intervention, the difficulty with feeding decreases and the nutritional markers increase. And you can see in this patient that during phase A2, that the effect of the intervention was, uh, was sustained. In this patient, there wasn't a great deal of difference uh, in the, in the, between the phases A and B, certainly in terms of, of the pattern, but the, me, the mean uh, difficulty declined uh, somewhat. Uh, you can see there's a lot of variance here, but the interesting thing is, is that in phase A2, the effect was in fact sustained. And again, uh, the corollary to that is that in the bottom graphs, the nutritional markers all increased. Again, similar pattern in this patient uh, with, uh, with a slightly sustained effect of the intervention. Again, this patient very successful in the sense of um, a great decline between phase A and phase B in the uh, mean level of feeding difficulty. And this was sustained very nicely in phase A2. So this is not just an effect of the intervention. There is some long-term uh, effect on, on the patients as a result of the intervention, which is very, very, uh, it's very pleasing, in fact, to show that you can actually do something to alleviate. So quickly, uh, this patient, similar pattern uh, between phase A uh, one and phase B. However, um, the level of difficulty uh, did uh, increase again in the in phase A2. Also, uh, the concomitant uh, marker nutritional markers are all improved in this patient. So the relationship between the feeding difficulty and the nutritional markers here isn't isn't tied in exactly, but we we don't observe um, a, a great a greatly sustained effect. But we do notice an improvement in nutritional markers. And final two patients, again, in this patient, the uh, level of difficulty bounced back again to the original level and the nutritional markers fell. So this is one patient where the intervention was effective between phase A and phase B, but wasn't sustained. And finally, in this patient, we see a sustained effect. So you can see that uh, not all of these, uh, not all of the patients were equally successful uh, and, and nearly all of them we managed to reduce the feeding difficulty with the intervention compared with no intervention. Some of them were sustained and it had a good effect in many of the patients on the nutritional markers. So this is well worth considering as an intervention. Now, I'm showing you someone else's research here. This is Helen Keller, who worked with uh, Susan Slaughter at the University of British Columbia in Alberta and Canada. And they did a large nationwide study of food intake in residents living in long-term care. And I'm showing you this because in this study, they used the EDFED scale as one of their outcomes. And what they were able to do was to do the following. They were able to tie in uh, a unit score on the EDFED 
to the number of kilocalories per day uh, that that a patient lost if they had a higher score on the edfed more more uh, feeding difficulty uh, they had a decrease in kilocalorie intake of 63 kilocalories per day and also three grams uh, per day of protein now the what we did was use this uh, particular um, score to try and look at how the uh, EdFed improvements on average in our study uh, were actually helping to increase uh, kilocalorie intake. We only looked at the kilocalories uh, intake here. Uh, so what we did was we did a, an economic analysis of this and I'm just going to present that economic analysis and then I'll be uh, summarise and, and finish the session. So this is the result of our economic analysis. First of all, we looked at the cost of uh, nursing labour uh, on average for the nurses who were involved in the study. Uh, we estimated this. This is using UK currency at £40 per hour. We called that A. And then we looked at the length of the intervention on average, which was about 105 hours. And then by uh, multiplying A by B, we arrived at C which is £4,200 for the total cost of an intervention. Then we looked at the value of, of one unit change in the EdFed uh, score, which is a, a change in kilocalories. We called this D, and we know that to be 63 kilocalories. So we then looked at the mean decline in the EdFed score between the two phases of the study. Uh, we called that E. That's uh, between A1 and E2, and we worked that out at being 1.36 units. So using those figures, uh, we calculated that the uh, the change in kilocalories in total were 86 kilocalories, and that the cost of that uh, was something like £50 per kilocalorie. And that works out at around 400 RMB. But of course, the costs of nursing labour may be very different in the in our two countries. So we were able to put a figure to this and we didn't make any decision ourselves as to whether this is a cost effective uh, intervention. We would have to leave that to managers and health economists to tell us, but at least we've been able through the study uh, to provide some crude information on the effectiveness and the costing of using uh, spaced retrieval uh, to help to prompt older people with dementia uh, to eat better at mealtimes. So to summarise the session, uh, first of all, uh, as I made a point at the beginning, we're unlikely to see a decline in the numbers of people with dementia in the next few decades. Problems associated with dementia, for example, mealtime difficulties, will therefore increase. And we've seen that it's possible to alleviate uh, mealtime difficulties through a, a range of strategies. Specifically, these can be environmental and at the group level and also at the individual level. For example, the spaced retrieval work that I presented there. It remains for others to see if this is cost-effective in the real world. So I'd like to th once again thank you very, very much for this uh, opportunity uh, to speak to you. And if you want to contact me, uh, that's my, my email there. Uh, you can also check my research record at ORCID. Uh, if there are any particular uh, papers from these studies that you would like to see, I'm very happy uh, to send them to you. I know you shouldn't in China, but you can if you want to uh, follow me on Twitter. I just warn you, it's a personal Twitter. It's not a professional Twitter, but some people seem to like to follow me there. And finally, down in the bottom right, you'll recognize the um, WeChat logo. You're very welcome to scan that and to use that to contact me or to keep in contact with me if you prefer to, to do it that way. So finally, once again, thank you to colleagues at West China School of Nursing for this invitation to talk about uh, research and mealtimes uh, and older people with dementia. I've presented some of my own work here. And of course, I must acknowledge that a lot of this work wasn't done personally by me, but by my 
PhD students, so I'd like to thank them. And once again, finally, thank you. And I hope that you found that helpful and useful.